I'm Scott L. Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I'm going to be answering the question as to why are short-term rental apartments so expensive in Nicaragua when regular apartments are so cheap? There's got to be something that explains this, and there absolutely is. So I'm going to dive into that so that people understand why what they're looking for does different things under different circumstances. It just helps with understanding the housing market and what you can reasonably find, what you're looking for, and how to set your expectations. We'll get to all that right after the bubble. If you've gone apartment shopping here in Nicaragua, you've probably noticed that apartments and houses that you can rent are incredibly cheap. We talk about this on the program quite often. The affordability of long-term rentals is insanely amazing. It's so low. You can get into a house, a two-bedroom, one-bath house for, house for about $150 a month, and ones that expats tend to be pretty happy with start much closer to, but not quite at $200 a month. Given those numbers, people then expect that short-term rentals are going to be very comparable in price. And then they discover that they aren't or that none are available at all. Those are two different problems. But the incredible difference in price often explains a little bit as to why there aren't that many available. Because people get their expectations set when they're looking at becoming an expat and they say, I can buy a house for this cheap, I can get an apartment for this cheap. Why would I then get a short, short term rental that costs so much more? Well, let's break it down and let me explain. So first of all, let's assume we're just looking for the ease of simple numbers. A standard apartment that's two bedroom, one bath, nice and, and luxurious. It's got lots of space, not really luxurious, but a very nice, comfortable place for $200 a month. This could be in a gated community or it might be a standalone house somewhere. It could be a standard apartment or a traditional house. Like everything falls into that pricing category if you look around enough. Of course, you can find places that are much more expensive. It depends where you are. But even in a gated community, it may cost that. Given that, the first thing is then, well, how much more is it going to cost for a short term? Of course, if I'm paying for a year, I'm still paying by the month. Short terms must be pretty comparable. The premium would just be a few dollars, but that is not at all the case. So first of all, when you're doing long term rentals, you're assuming a minimum of six months and almost always a one year term. That's not a big deal. Most people are used to that, but that's what long term normally involves. Also, with long term or standard rentals, you're also not going to get appliances. It's not quite as dramatic as Italy, where the entire kitchen isn't there. You still have a sink in most cases, but not 100%. But you're not going to come with any appliances. There's no refrigerator, no oven, no microwave, no coffee maker. Nothing like that is going to come in a standard rental. Now, here in Nicaragua, the cost of property and buildings is very low, but the cost of appliances, while not high, is not low. It is higher just by a small amount, maybe 10%, over what you would pay in, let's just say, North America, the United States, Canada, or the UK. So you're going to pay a small premium. Now, that on its own is not a big deal. You say 10%, I pay 10% extra. I'm not sure why I would want to, but uh, it's not a big deal. And you're right, it's not a big deal until you start doing the math on an apartment and realize that moving into an apartment or taking a month to month on an apartment, it's not hard for the cost of your appliances, depending on the appliances you have, to start adding up to a significant amount compared to the cost of a rental. In the United States, let's say you're getting a rental in downtown Dallas and it's about $1,000 a month. That would be an actual pretty good deal and when you're looking at that thousand dollars, it's probably a pretty small spot, a one bedroom, maybe a studio, but we'll say one bedroom with a small kitchenette. The appliances in that kitchenette are going to, over time, be an incredibly small number compared to the cost of the apartment itself. That means that often the cost of the appliances is lost in the cost of the apartment. Oh, it's an extra $50. They just tack that on. They're included. You don't think about it. But when you're getting a long term here in Nicaragua and suddenly you start looking at the appliances, you realize, oh, that's why it's so cheap is because that huge cost is not in there. But if you're doing a, doing a short term rental, then you have the challenge that obviously that needs to come furnished. And that means that everything, the fridge, the oven, all those things. Plates and all those things, those are still pretty cheap here. Uh, couches, chairs, television, all those things need to be included. And some of them, like televisions, can easily be double the cost in the United States. Now, you don't buy them very often, so if you're living here in Nicaragua, you don't think about a TV being an expensive item that causes problems in your budget because, sure, you're going to have to spend $800 instead of $400 like in the U.S., but that $400 is just disappears when you save so much money and you have better taxes or whatever. But when you're 
putting it into an apartment, suddenly you have to add that into the cost of everything. And that becomes a really noticeable amount that when appliances cost between 10 and 100 percent more, typically more like 10. But a few things like the TV are going to be 100 percent more. And then with a short term rental, you're also going to have things like Internet needs to be included. It just for practical reasons has to be. Now, Internet could be very cheap. But if you're an expat or a digital nomad, and you're looking at a short term rental. You probably don't want weak Internet. Some people do and some people are fine with that. So they may be happy with the 20 or 30 or 40 dollar systems that are asynchronous and just cable, whatever. And that's absolutely fine. They work pretty well. But if you're looking to have an apartment that you're going to be able to work from, you need really fast, stable internet, you're going to want fiber and synchronous connections, and suddenly you're looking at more like $80 to $120 per month. Of course, some places may scale it back when no one's there. Depending on the person who's renting, they slow it down, and you can pay more for more speed. That could be an option. But let's just say in that $200 building, you may be looking at a $100 internet bill on top of that as something that has to be included. If you're doing a long-term rental, that's something you would pay for separately, and you would not think of it in terms of the cost of the rental. But in a short term, you have to. And suddenly that's 50% the cost of the rental. Again, if you were in Dallas and paying $100 on your $1,000, yes, you would notice it, but it's not so significant. It's only 10%, not 50. It's not that the internet is more expensive here in Nicaragua. In fact, often it's cheaper on average. It's cheaper, but it's pretty similar. It's not dramatically more or less in any circumstance. So it's very... Uh, different in its percentage of the rental price. So really quickly, a $200 home is suddenly a $300 home, plus those appliances may have a $200 or $300 per month amateurization, just like they would in the United States, maybe just a tad higher, but not that much. But that suddenly that $600, instead of in the United States, maybe an empty apartment would have been only $600 once you put all the appliances and stuff in, it comes up to $1,000. When 200 goes up to 600, instead of 600 going up to 1,000, in one case you really notice it, in one you really don't. It's simple things like that. Now you also have the problem that a lot of things in an apartment can be damaged. And just like in the United States, the amount of damage that can be done in an apartment can happen very quickly and be very high. Unlike other things, damage has a tendency, it's still less expensive to fix damage in Nicaragua. But in many cases, you're going to be looking at something that is much closer to the same as in the United States. So, for example, if you were to have a, a tenant who just did wild damage and completely destroyed the apartment, you may be looking at four or five thousand dollars of damage, replace appliances, fix broken windows, whatever. And I've seen this happen. I know of people who've rented apartments for a single month short term here in Nicaragua and had a tenant do over three thousand dollars of damage. Well, if you're only able to earn a profit of 20, 30, maybe at best $100 per month, that means you're looking at renting successfully with zero problems and pure profit for years, maybe four years to have any reasonable chance. And that's continuous rental. You can't have time where no one's there of continuous rental just to cover the cost of one time damages. If that happens twice, you could be looking at a lifetime of not being able to be profitable on a rental unit. In the United States, yes, you could do more damage because things are more expensive, but most of the damage tends to happen to appliances and those things where they're actually cheaper in the US. So the amount of the overall cost of an apartment that you have to worry about insuring against, which of course comes from cost in the, the rental agreement, here in Nicaragua actually has to be a little bit higher to accommodate not just a greater percentage possibility of damage, but in some cases, an actual larger potential amount of damage to be had. If you were to break the TV in a hotel room in the United States, often that TV only costs them two to $300. They get them in bulk. They get super low quality ones. We can't do that here in Nicaragua. We don't have bulk television options. We have to go to the store and buy what they have. And often we're not going to find under anything under five or $600. That's not outrageous in normal life. It's totally something we can handle. But if you're talking about suddenly having damage in a rental apartment, you're looking at $600 of television damage if someone threw you know, a controller got mad playing a video game, threw a controller at the TV, that damage in the United States might be 20% of one month's rental, but in Nicaragua, it may be 100% of one month's rental. So the amount that you have to collect to insure against damage here in Nicaragua, while may not actually be larger, is a huge percentage, whereas in the United States, it's a small one or comparatively. So a bunch of things like that come together to make it where the cost of having a short term rental while still wildly cheaper in Nicaragua than in the US or Canada or pretty much anywhere else doesn't line up the way that it emotionally feels like it would 
because of a long-term rental price. I've actually had people say, oh, I can get a long-term rental for $200. What's a short-term? What's going to be $220? I'm expecting no more than $250 a month. And it's like, that's madness. That would be, that wouldn't even cover the extra cost. The apartment would be 100% lost to whatever investor is trying to, to lease it. Uh, so that doesn't make any sense at all. People really aren't thinking through just how much goes into a short-term rental versus a long-term one. And of course, short-term rentals include things like Airbnbs. Or Airbnbs, of course, do it by the day or the weekend. We're talking generally weeks or months, but the same rules apply. There's a reason why Airbnb costs a significant portion of what a month does, and they insure across large numbers of, of uh, customers, and they have recourses, and they have credit cards. And if you're doing individual stuff or you're here in Nicaragua, when you're international, rentals become much harder. In the United States, if you're renting, there's a bit more teeth if someone does a bunch of damage and tries to escape. But even there, I know people who have, you know, lent their house for a period of a couple of years, came back and found their house completely destroyed with tens of thousands of dollars of damage in a house that was only worth $80,000 to start with. 50% the cost of the house was not just the house, but the land the, and all the property and the outbuildings, everything. 50% of the, the cost of everything was lost in damage from renters. That kind of stuff is really dramatic. But in the U.S., it's less likely to happen simply because of the math, right? There's there's more uh, legal systems to take someone to task. There's more ways to go after someone. It's harder to escape, harder to get out of the country and so forth. Here in Nicaragua, when people do a lot of damage as expats, it's really common, not as expats, but as foreigners, it is very common for them to just get on a plane and disappear even before their place gets inspected and they're gone and they don't have to worry about the ramifications. Of course, they can't come back to the country, but in that case, they probably don't care. It's a small country. They're taking off. They're just going to move on to the next place. Literally have seen this happen. It is a real thing that people do. And so the risks here in Nicaragua, especially when renting, renting to foreigners, is quite high. So people tend to require uh, as much or more deposits than in the U.S. There isn't such a hard time getting them back, I think, is in the U.S., but basically all the same rules apply. So I hope that that helps understand the scope of why it is so by comparison, expensive to have a short-term rental here in Nicaragua versus a long-term one. And it also, I think, makes it make sense why there aren't that many people interested in doing it. First of all, the amount of money that it takes to be able to do, do short-term rentals is extremely high. The cost of coming up with enough money to do a long-term only represents about 50% or less, maybe 40% of the total amount of investment that someone would have to come up with compared to doing a short-term. So if you're you're someone, you're going to invest in a house, you're going to go out and you're going to buy a house for $30,000 and you're going to rent that out as a long-term rental, that's only $30,000 that you have to come up with. But if you want to do a short term with that same thing, you may have to come up with sixty or seventy thousand dollars to put everything in the house, get it all ready, and over the same amount of time cover the damages and replacements of appliances. Because this is important, right? Appliances wear out, especially in rentals. They get abused really quickly, so they have to provide things that are very generic, work for a lot of people, uh, but also can stand the test of time and are easy to replace. And you do have to replace them because people, when renting, are much harder on things than when they own them. And so all of that comes together that it's very hard to come up with the amount of money and people don't tend to understand why the short terms are so expensive. And so they tend to not want to do it. So you tend to get a lot of people who look but don't take it that argue about the price that end up unhappy because they were expecting to somehow live completely for free and not even pay for the things that they're consuming and so forth. Now add on to that what people can do and do do in the real world, and I've talked about this in an episode maybe a year ago, is that if you're actually planning on being in Nicaragua for a while and you want to be able to move around and have the flexibility and the benefits of a short-term rental, but you're not here just for two months or three months, you're actually here for a while, just not in one place, it generally, not always, but generally is going to make sense for you to invest in the appliances and furniture and television and things that you want, things that are really good for you, and then take long-term rentals. And you can do a bunch of running the math and it doesn't always make sense, but sometimes it will way more often than it feels like it would. And so let me explain. So you move to Nicaragua, you say, well, I wanna live in 10 different places over the course of the next three to seven years. So I'm gonna move around a lot. If you're in the United States, you would absolutely do short-term rentals, take nothing with you, just move from place to place, have a backpack or some luggage and life would be easy, but you'd also pay this huge premium every month. 
no big deal. But if you're here in Nicaragua, you could do the same thing, but it would be even more expensive by comparison than in the US. So what, what would you do? You could buy the appliances that make sense for you because the fridge, the oven, they're gonna be standard sizes that fit almost anywhere. Of course, you may limit where you rent just a little bit, but it would be only a little bit. There are standard buildings all over the country that you would be able to move in between without any problem at all. You can get a TV, a really nice one if that's something that's important to you, or just a really cheap one if that's something you don't care about, or none at all if you don't watch TV. You just have your iPad and that's what you live on. You don't need your place to be furnished all the way. Someone doing a short-term rent Rental has to supply everything that someone expects to have in there, whether you're going to use it or not. That makes it even more expensive because they can't customize in a really cost-effective way. So you can buy all the right things for you. And then because they're yours, you can take care of them. You can treat them as something that you own. Of course, you can do that in the short term, but they can't bank on that. They have to be prepared to insure and replace all those things. Insure meaning that they save up and they self-insure by having enough money to replace whatever might get broken. You don't have to do that. You can take care of your stuff, be very delicate with it. Things that I own and use myself last forever. My GoPros go year after year after year because I take care of them. I don't let them get abused. I don't let them get dropped. I don't let them get thrown around. I never put them anywhere without a lens cover on. I do so many things to keep my equipment safe and it lasts so much longer than normal people's stuff does. My wife always jokes about how my book collection, I had a very large, the largest library of any private person I've ever known in my life was my own. And every single book looked like it was still sitting on the store shelf because as I read them, I carefully turned every page. I carefully held the spine so the spines wouldn't break. I'm just OCD about that. I'm not saying that's smart or a good idea or anything of the sort. In fact, I'm crazy. They're just books. It doesn't matter. And in the end, I ended up giving them all away and who cared anyway. But the point is, is that you can take care of your stuff in a way that other people won't. And your things can be a completely different investment, both customized for you and well taken care of. So you can reduce the cost of what it takes for you to effectively have short-term apartments by taking long-term ones. And in some cases, you're going to need to take longer rents than you normally would, but not at all. You may be able to go to a long-term rental place and argue down and say, look, I'm gonna pay you a little bit extra, I'm gonna put down a bigger deposit, I'm only taking it for three months, four months. Look, this is how much you want for six months, I'm gonna give you this little bit of a premium. I'm gonna put these guarantees. I'm doing this stuff and you can talk someone into it. It's gonna be hard, but you could do it. And if you're bringing all your own stuff and they know you're moving on, especially if you're moving on to another place with them, if they had more than one, you could make that work. It's gonna be a tough argument, but even if you couldn't, if you're looking at a place that costs 145 per month, you say, I wanna be there for four months. Well, what's it gonna cost? $290 to keep it for an extra two months and you're not there? What do you care? Keep it an extra two months. They'll probably, give you some kind of discount if you really work at it, right? I'm gonna turn it over to you two months early. I'm not saying give it to me for nothing, but like give me 50 bucks back at the end. Do something to save some money. Uh, get some flexibility. You don't have to move out exactly the day you think you are. You can move out whenever you want, right? Because you've paid for it for months, it's yours. Use it as storage, use both places, keep it for a while, find a way to use it. Uh, any number of things, right? It's, you can just pay, and that if you're just paying $300 extra, if you look at the big scope of things, maybe that's still saving you money versus going to a traditional short-term rental where you're paying for all the appliances to be included and the internet to be included and all that. And you can go get a uh, deal with whatever provider you like, Claro, Tigo, uh, Teco that I use, and potentially you can take your equipment with you and move from location to location and keep on the same service. So you're not necessarily turning that on and off, or maybe you are, but you're keeping the equipment, making it easy. They know you're moving. I have, I don't know people who've done this, so I don't know exactly how that would work there, but in theory that could work. There's a lot of things you could do to make yourself able to stay in the country and move around a lot over time. And if you need to take breaks between things, and that's one of the reasons you want to do a short-term rental, there's very easy ways. I have some episodes that, that touch on this pretty deeply. I guess that's that cover this in some episodes uh, where, you know, getting just a bodega, renting a place just for storage is so unbelievably cheap. That may be a thing that makes sense for you. Just keep a bodega somewhere where you can keep all of your stuff stored anytime you're not using it. Store anything that you don't use. Maybe you have a TV that you use sometimes but not others and you store it when you're not going to use it so it just stays protected. You don't have to move it around, whatever. There's so many ways to be a little bit flexible and creative. And if you're going to be here for any kind of long-term throughout the country, you can probably make it make sense to not use traditional short-term rentals. And again, this proves why so few people provide short-term rentals because it's just so hard to make them make sense. But for the few people who need them, they're completely available, they're completely affordable, they're just a surprisingly more expensive 
than you think they will be given how cheap long-term rentals are. But once you break it down and think about the factors and how it works, it makes total sense that it costs quite a bit more than it seems like to be able to cover all of the expenses that go into making an apartment able to be rented short-term in a market where appliances are not considered part of a rental under any circumstances, right? Those long-term rentals don't have appliances. But anytime you rent in the United States, you're like, I'm taking a two-year lease. You still expect there to be a fridge. You still expect there to be an oven, maybe not a TV. But a whole bunch of stuff is expected. Anytime you do short term, even more is expected. All right. So because those appliances and then furniture all have to be added in. And yes, furniture can be cheaper than in the US, but generally is about the same. You're just not looking at the big discounts. So thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And as always, share on social media, post the link somewhere, tell a friend about the show, send an email and say, hey, why aren't you watching the show? It's so cool. Learn about relocation all those stuff. And I will see all of you tomorrow. And if you're on the right devices and not blocking it, four videos should pop up on your screen. If you would be so kind as to click one of those and even just let it play in the background, if it doesn't interest you, it tells the algorithm that this is the show that we should be promoting. <laughs>